Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that this morning. We're going to be in Romans chapter 8 this morning. If you want to get your copy of God's Word, Romans chapter 8. Welcome to those that are joining us on Digital Church. We trust you're having a great day and are staying safe and warm. All right, Romans chapter 8. Oh, I have a thing nice there. Thank you. It's on page 790 if you have a Bible with a few in front of you. And if you do not have a Bible, please let me know. I would love to get a copy of God's Word into your hands. It's one of the greatest things I could ever give to you. Technical difficulties we are experiencing this morning. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 28. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. One of my favorite verses in Scripture. And we know that all things work together for the good to those that love God, to those who are called according to to his purpose. Thank you for your help. We're in the middle of the series on the power of the importance of prayer. What difference does prayer make? And how does it continue to change our lives? This morning I want to tell you of a a new hobby that has come into the Brown House, and I don't want to uh, put it in the wrong light, so I'm going to tell you the whole story, and there is a point to this, it's going to be a theme throughout the morning. Uh, I love Legos. When I was a kid, I always used to have Legos. Now, back when I was a kid, back when I was a kid, my parents just got me this big old blue top. Of Legos. And then they had like, like a little green pad, and then you could do all of your creation with it. And, and your mind could just go, and it, you could create anything. I could create houses. Side note, I still have those Legos. And then sometimes the girls, Hannah loves to play with Legos. But recently, Sarah, last year, she's gotten into Legos, but she hasn't gotten into those type of Legos. She's got into the Legos that as you see here. She's constructed the Lincoln Memorial she got. And this took her, I think this took her probably about a half an hour, maybe not an hour to do. The first one that she got, we got her for Christmas. And this one, it, 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 was, it was just a teaser for a while. We, we sat at it, we had a car table, and we opened it, and this was what we saw. Just a pile of Legos that didn't make any sense. And we sat there, and, and if you know me, I, I don't have AD, but I don't have a whole lot of patience. But we sat there and said, okay, we're going to figure this out. And we looked at it and we go, this, we can't figure it out. We need some help. So, you know what we did? We got the directions. And in directions after direction, put this piece here, put this piece here, put this piece here, put this piece here. Piece here. and eventually we built a capital. And if you want to come look, then you have some senators in the rotunda right here. And we sat there and we went day after day and we worked. And I think this book has about three days. So we, she had a lot of fun. And so now she's working on a couple other ones. She's working on the New York City skyline. And the one that her and I are working on, and this is where I need to give full disclosure, this is Mount Rushmore. We're pushing about six months on Mount Rushmore. We got discouraged. Because all these pieces that are here are really hard. And each one of these pieces is one single Lego. And in fact, I have fat fingers with really tiny Legos, and it's just not working out. And, and so, so we're counting one, two, three, three four, four, five. Okay, okay what are a, a yellow, yellow one. one. No, no, that's, that's an off yellow. yellow. We need a pure yellow. yellow. And, and we've gotten, gotten discouraged. And, and we've gotten, gotten frustrated. And sometimes we've even lost, lost a couple, couple pieces. pieces. And, and I, I wonder, wonder this, this morning, morning how many of us are looking at our prayer life going, I'm, I'm discouraged. discouraged. I'm frustrated. Because... I have fat fingers, fingers and it's a very specific, specific prayer request going in some place. I just can't, 
can't make sense of it. And I wonder this morning, how many of you are saying, this is what my prayer life looks like. I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to build a prayer life. I need some help. I need someone to walk beside me so I can turn this and it's something beautiful that looks like, like this. And I think and I wonder how many of you are sitting out there this morning to discourage. And if anything, this morning I want to encourage you to sit back down at the card table, get out the instructions, and then let's get back to her. All right, Romans chapter 8. All right, I know you know that we need to get the context of what is going on. I read all of Romans chapter 8 in anticipation of this. And in your mind, in your notes, in your, in your bulletin, I want to encourage you to look at that. This is Romans chapter 8. I want to sum up Romans chapter 8 in two words. Suffering and hope. Suffering and hope. Suffering and hope. And hope. Because, because if we don't understand the context of Romans chapter 8, we're not only going to be able to lean into Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 28, and really understand the thrust of what Paul is telling us. Romans chapter 8 reminds us that we have suffering. We are here this morning. It is cold. It is bone chilling. It is sub zero with the wind chill. Uh, some of us were here talking before the service. It was really hard to pull yourself out of that warm bed, especially if you had an electric blanket. And it was really tempting, really tempting to just turn on the digital church and worship Jesus in spirit, truth, and in warmth. And if you're there today, I'm glad you're here blind to watch in the digital church. But when we remind ourselves that we are here and we're suffering, Romans chapter 8 tells us that we are suffering because of the choices that were made in Genesis chapter 3. Three people in Romans chapter 8 are suffering. Three groups of people. First of all, humanity is suffering. We are groaning because of sin. Because of the physical effects that sin has upon us. The second group of people, or second thing that's suffering and groaning, is creation. All of creation grows because it was cursed. I can take you back to Genesis chapter 3. We touched on that very, very briefly last week. The third person that's groaning is the, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is groaning not because he is suffering from sin. He can't because he is God. But he is suffering because he is watching us suffer. And there's nothing that you could say to do or help someone that's going through tough times, but just groan with them and see them suffering. Those are the three people that are suffering in Romans chapter 8. However, if we're suffering, we have to have hope. And every time in Scripture, we can find hope. We can find hope in the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 tells us there's hope in the struggle because we have a down payment of the Holy Spirit. And because we have the Holy Spirit, we have a ministry from Him, and, and He has a ministry to us to help us in our groanings because we are suffering. So what can we do when we come to life and we say, life just doesn't make sense. My life is like Legos. How do I get this pile of Legos to turn into something beautiful like this? That is where we're going with Romans chapter 8. All right, let's get into it. So likewise, all right, you may have a different translation. Different translations say it in different ways. Likewise, different, another trans translation says in the same way. So we need to go back and get the context. I just gave you the context. It's again so very, very important. We read with 2020 vision. The 20 verses before and the 20 verses after. Because if we don't understand all the groanings and the suffering and the hope that we have, we're not going to understand the thrust and the comfort, the peace and the ministry the Holy Spirit can have. All right, so likewise, I just did all that for you. All right, so likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. I don't like to admit that I'm weak. I don't know if it's because I'm a man. I don't know if it's because I'm an American. I don't know if it's because I'm prideful. Maybe it's a little bit of everything. But I don't like to admit that I'm weak. I don't like to admit that I need help. I certainly don't like to admit when I'm lost and need help finding directions. I certainly don't like to get out the little directions and say, put piece A here. I'd rather just figure it out myself. That, friends, 
That lasts about five minutes, and I get really frustrated because all these little pieces don't make sense. Sometimes, we, all the time, we need to remember that we are weak, that we are broken, that we are frail, that this is not the way it's supposed to be. So here comes the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. How much money would Mattel make if they built all these Legos, they shipped it to you, you bought it, and then they never gave you the instructions? They wouldn't make a whole lot of money, would they? Neither does God leave us alone when he sees that we need help. We have this ministry of the Holy Spirit. For we do not know what we should pray for. We as broken people do not know what we should pray for. Why? Because this is not the way that it's supposed to be. This is not God's plan. This is not God's intent for how he set it up in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. When the fall happened and we came broken, we became weak, we lost the full perspective of God's plan. So what we need to do is we do not know what we should pray for. One commentator put it this way. He says, even the Christian who prays sincerely, faithfully, and regularly cannot possibly know God's purposes in concerning all of his own needs or the needs of others for whom he prays. Let me break this down a little bit. I don't even know what I can pray for in my own life. Because as I look at my life, I have a whole lot of Legos put together. Remember that piece I showed you? I feel like this is life, and it's just a pile. And I understand certain pieces go certain ways. All right? I understand that, that the little pillars here on the Lincoln Memorial, they go around the side. I can see that because of the picture. But how to build the underneath or how to build inside, or goodness, with the capital? You want to see how many little pieces are in the capital? I don't know where all that goes. I know that I know that the guy on the top, the statue, he goes on top. But I know certain things, but there are certain opportunities I have that I don't understand. I need to have someone help me navigate through my life. I don't even understand my own life, let alone what I'm supposed to pray for you. Oh, goodness, I don't even know what you're going through. So how do I pray for you? Well, I don't know how. And I feel like sometimes we look at this going, life is like Legos. How do I work through this? All right, let's keep going. So the Spirit, he says, we don't, even, we don't even know what we should pray for. But there's a ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit himself makes intercession. He comes and he stands before us. He comes and he is the buffer between myself and God. Look at what he does. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us. With groanings which cannot be uttered. So there's some type of communication between God the Father and God the Spirit that happens that is wordless. One commentator, he says that there is intertrinitarian communication. And I'm going to leave it at that. Because I don't know. I can't explain it. My feeble, weak mind cannot understand how I pray, the Spirit takes that, He intercedes for it, He groans with words that are not even said. There are some times that and the best way I can understand this on a human point of view is sometimes husbands and wives, mom and dads look at each other and their kids coming and you can shoot them a glance and you know you better say no to that child because she just said no. Right? You gotta look. You ever get the look? Okay, maybe I'm the okay. Deacons, we need to have a meeting. Apparently nobody else gets the look but me. So maybe I need to have a talk with you. I get the look, okay? Let me go on a little rabbit trail here. Sometimes I get the look from four girls. Which means get out of this illustration because I'm going to pay for it when I get home. All right? Do you ever have that look? Nothing is said, but there's a whole lot of communication that's happened. That's, that, that is the best way I can understand that the Holy Spirit has wordless communication with God the Father. There's some type of intertrinitarian communication that happens. I don't understand it, but it doesn't mean I don't believe it. I understand it, I don't understand it, but I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit 
can take and intercede for when I pray. Because sometimes I pray and then I'm like, God, I don't want that to happen. Because I see more of the puzzle. I see more of the pieces. And I'm like, that piece is not still there. The Spirit, he's the one that's helping me to pray the way I ought to pray. Found this great quote by this commentator. He says, in, the, in his word, which is the Bible, the word of God, God gives us enough truth for us to be responsible, but enough mystery for us to be dependent. But wow, that is so true. I know what I know, and I, I know what I believe. And God has given me enough truth to keep me accountable. But God does not show me all that I need because then I wouldn't be dependent upon him. If I knew everything, I wouldn't need faith. If I knew everything about the Legos, hey friends, I wouldn't need the, the God. And this morning, the key phrase, the key idea is the Holy Spirit. He is our guide to help us in our prayer life. All right, let's keep going. Love this passage. Love this passage. Romans chapter 8, verse 27. Now he who searches the heart Oh, we know that God searches a heart. And you know I love 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. I want you to turn, if you want, or make a note to Acts chapter 1, verse 24. What a great reminder for me this, in my studies this week from Acts chapter 1. What's going on in Acts chapter 1? Judas has went out, he has hung himself, the apostles, which we first called disciples, they've seen the risen Christ, are not called the apostles, they are trying to find a replacement. They're praying about this. These very guys that have been with Christ, that have seen Christ, they've touched Christ, they've sat under the teachings of Jesus, they say in Acts chapter 1, verse 27, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show us which of these two you have us to choose. So again, we see another instance that God searches the heart. What a great reminder that sometimes I don't use the right words. You know that, I know that. Sometimes you don't use the right words. Prayer is not about the right words, finding the right formula. God looks right into your heart and says, what is on your heart? What is concerning you? What is your beat that is in your heart that is causing you to bring your prayers to him? God searches the heart. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is. There's no division. You can't pin God the Holy Spirit against God the Father, just as we do or did with our parents, right? I could pin mom versus dad and then kind of manipulate my way through and get what I want. You can't do that with God. You see that the Spirit, He knows what's going on. He has some type of communication that is not being able to be more of a single act than this one other thing. Notice who speaks without words, the Spirit. That is not applied to us. We continue to talk to God with our words. This is not an opportunity, and don't allow people to tell you, oh, the Spirit groans with the Bible. We're supposed to pray in utterances in a language that we do not know. That's not what it's saying here, friends. This is done only by the Spirit. When we pray, we pray in words that we can understand. We pray in words that other people can understand. And then the Spirit himself takes that, and it does that intertributary communication. I want to make sure we understand. I'm not advocating. I'm actually speaking against. You should always pray and know what you're praying. All right, let's keep going. So he makes intercession for the saints. Well, who is the one who received the benefit? It's the ones that believe in God. It's the saints. And if I could take it, I would put a new meaning in this, if, I, if you will, because he makes intercession for the believers. So if you want to have the ear of God, you have to have that relationship with God. It's that simple and it's that difficult. The Spirit is here and He's taking our prayers and He's, if you will, translating that and He's making intercession. Because we don't know what we should pray for. Because of our brokenness. Because of our weakness. Because of our suffering. Let's take a step back. Right. Sometimes what happens is we get so lost in the details of it, we forget the big picture. What's Romans chapter 8 about? The two words, suffering and hope. Suffering and hope. Suffering and hope. When I suffer, I pray that the suffering will end. Sometimes when I suffer, I lose the hope that I have. Look at verse 27. 
The Spirit searches my heart. And then he knows what the mind of God is. And he makes intercession based upon the suffering I'm going through and the hope that I have. He reminds me of the hope. He takes that to the throne of God. And what happens? He makes intercession for the believers based upon what? The will of God. Well, what is the will of God? We find the will of God in his word. Someone comes to you and says, God told me that I should do this. Do you know what we should be able to do according to Scripture? Have it validated in God's written word. Because God does not contradict his spoken word and his written word. So if someone ever comes to you and says, God told me to do this, you better be able to find it in God's written word. And if you can't, then that person's had a misunderstanding. Either A, a misunderstanding of the written Scripture, or a mishearing about what God told them. Because God does not contradict himself. All right, let's keep going. Verse 28. And we know, i got to come back to Mount Rushmore. i got to come back to Mount Rushmore. Sitting in the box. Actually, it's in the dining room. Uh, on the floor, right next to the games. It's still sitting there. It's been six months since we looked at that. Maybe not as much. I'm discouraged by this. All the pieces are there. I think. I hope. But I'm tired of counting every little block. And I'm not seeing much progress. Our Mount Rushmore, poor Abe doesn't have a head. He's got the little beard going right now. Uh, George is, he's still in the box somewhere. We're discouraged. I am discouraged. I'm not speaking for anybody else in my family. I'm discouraged. But I know that all the pieces are there. And if I work at it, it will come together. Look at what Scripture says. And we know. Look at what it doesn't say. And we wish, or we hope for, or we have mild confidence. What's going on in Romans 8? The suffering. When you suffer, you sometimes lose perspective. And so Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, and we. Who's the we? Believers. Believers. Saints. We know. We have an assurance. We have a firm belief. Are you there this morning? Are you sitting here resting assured, knowing that all that's going on, God has a plan? I want my life to look beautiful like this. But right now, I sometimes feel like i got some Legos that are missing. But I can come back, and I know. I can have the calm assurance to know that all things work together for the good. God has the big picture. God has the big plan. And when I pray, I pray seeing bits and pieces, little Legos that I'm trying to put together. And here comes God. He's sitting there with the whole plan going, that Lego doesn't go there. It goes over here. This Lego goes here. And we know that all things work together for the good. To those that love God. What a great study you can do this afternoon. If you want this week in your devotions, I put down in your bulletin some studies for you to do. Character studies. Devotional reading that you could do. I thought about Abraham. Abraham didn't see the whole picture. He was told to go and start walking. God, when am I going to start walking when I tell you to stop? Abraham didn't see the whole picture. He was given one Lego at a time. And then that Lego ended up being a beautiful tapestry of the children of Israel. Look in your bulletins. Joseph, that's a whole series in itself. Hey, good news. I got the like, next eight years planned just by these things right here. Joseph, he was young. He was sold into slavery. All I was doing was going out and showing my brothers my coat, and he gets thrown into the pit, and then he gets sold into slavery, and he ends up in jail. What, what is going on? And God says, hold on. All things work together for those that love God. Look at this piece, and then you know, later down the road, Joseph is put in second in command. He has these dreams. He saves the world, or at least the nation of Israel. Look at Noah, Genesis chapter 6. The only righteous man that was there in a world full of evil. 
No, I want you to build a boat. Go home and read Genesis chapter 6. It'll take you probably 10 minutes. How long did it take Noah to build a boat? A hundred years. And we forget that when we're walking through it, we forget that we know that we have this calm assurance. Look at Esther. Poor girl. You ever read Esther from a, from a girl's point of view? I, I've got that in my house. You read it from a girl's point of view. You take it from her home. She's taken it to the king and she's, oh, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even know what to do. But God has me here for what? For such a time as this. Look at Judas. Look at the crucifixion of Christ. What are you doing, God? This does certainly, this certainly does not make sense. But yet God has a plan. Look at Peter and Paul. They had such a sharp division, they split ways. Oh no, the church has division. It's not good. But God says, hold on, I've got a plan. Sometimes, friends, look at me. Sometimes when we go through these difficult times, we forget that we know. And this knowing turns into wishful thinking. Boy, I hope God's in control. No, Paul says in the midst of suffering, we know, I know that I know, that all things work together for good, for those that love God. Do you love God? Oh, I love God. But do you love God when the times are difficult? It's easy to love God when times are going well. It's tough to love God when things are not going the way that you find. So for those that love God, do you love God? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. Are you following in his ways? Are you following in his word? Or are you using God more as a genie and not God? Great question to ask yourself. Because I want things to work together for me for good, but I've got to love God first. And you know what scripture says? Just because you love God doesn't mean you get a pathway to peace. If the world hated Jesus, the world's going to persecute us as well. I don't like to preach that. Can I preach more about the love of Jesus? So, we know that all things work together for the good, for those that love God, who are called according to his purpose. God has a plan. God has a grand masterpiece that is in mind. Here are your references to the different guys I just went through. So the question that I have for you this morning, come back to my Legos. Probably this afternoon, I'm going to have some homework, and I'm probably going to sit back down to the table and start working on Legos. Right? Dad, we need to get this done. And I wonder if you're sitting here this morning going, this is what life looks like. And you don't know how to put it together. Hey, here's a secret. I don't know how to put it together either. But here's what I've been challenged with. I need to pray. I need to continue to go to God saying, God, I need you to guide me because this is what you've given me. It's only through your spirit of him interceding for me that all things work together for the good. It's going to be hard work. Have you ever done these Lego things? My goodness, they're fun, but they can be, hey, they made me pull out my hair. It's tough. It's difficult. It's not easy. But neither is following Christ. So we have a helper when life does not make sense. And right now, maybe your life is not making sense. But I'm going to bring you back to the truth that's found in God's Word. That through the suffering, through the groaning, we have hope. And we can know that all things work together. Because when you lose hope, do you know what you first do? You blame God and you stop talking to Him. And you start doing things on your own. And I try to do things on my own. And when I try to do things on my own, it certainly does not look beautiful like this. But you know what I've also learned? When I do things God's way, when I follow His instructions, do you know what His instructions are? His instructions are found in His Word. When I'm faithful in following His ways, and following His Word, and relying on the Spirit, praying to Him, then I realize 
that God sees the country of Asia. Friend, if you're discouraged today, don't stop praying. Realize there's someone there that can help you in your prayers. And if you don't know what else to pray, just sit there and God can see your heart. Let's close in a word of prayer. This morning, can I pray for you? Or is there anybody here this morning that would say to me, um, I'm discouraged and I haven't been talking to God. Would you pray for me that I can get back to praying and relying upon the Word of God and the Spirit of God to help me through my times? Is there anybody here this morning? See that one hand, two hands, three hands. If you're on digital church, send me a private message. I'd love to pray for you personally. Lord, I'm so thankful for your Word. Lord, I'm so thankful that, that we have enough knowledge that you have given us that we are held accountable. But yet I'm so thankful that there's things that we don't understand that we need to stay reliant upon you. And Lord, oftentimes in our life we pray and we don't even know how to pray. Scripture tells us we're so weak and we're broken that we don't know how to pray, but you have not left us there in our weakness and brokenness that we don't have help. So Lord, as we look at this, this Lego set that is somewhat similar to our life, not knowing how to put it together. May we not continue to try to do it ourselves, but may we rely upon you, continually to be in prayer for, with you and to you, knowing that all things work together for the good, for those that love God. Lord, help us to love you. Help us to have that relationship with you. And if there's someone here in this building, if there's someone watching on Digital Church, may they have an uncomfortableness until they have that conversation and start that relationship with you. Lord, for those that are saying, I need to get back into prayer, I need to get back into communication with you. Lord, help them not to become distracted. Help them not to become discouraged by all the pieces but to work on one piece at a time, knowing that we have someone here to help us navigate through our prayer life. Lord, help us to draw close to you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Thankful for the ladies to come back and to minister with us as we sing this great hymn, or great song, and it's called Yet Not I, But Christ Through Me. So let's remind ourselves of this great, great song. All right, why don't you stay with us and sing. <laughs>